Uh, delighted to welcome uh, you all to this special session on climate action in a time of debt distress. Uh, I'm Uli Waltz. I'm the director of the Centre for Sustainable Finance at SOAS, University of London, uh, and I'm very privileged to chair this session uh, with an absolutely outstanding cast of speakers. Uh, a global debt crisis is looming even before COVID. Uh, the IMF and the World Bank deemed global public debt burdens unsustainable uh, for a majority of developing countries, and COVID has made this problem much, much worse. So this new systemic debt crisis uh, is emerging at a time uh, when the global, crisis, uh, global climate crisis demands the urgent mobilization of huge efforts on both climate mitigation and adaptation. And against uh, the debt crisis, um, while enabling far reaching actions for climate adaptation and mitigation. So basically, what are the options for debt rescheduling that will allow for people centered uh, investments that address climate change? Um, while expanding job opportunities and livelihoods. Let me very briefly introduce the speakers. We will first have a keynote by Alicia Barthena, who is Executive Secretary of the UN Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, Alicia has had a very distinguished career in the UN and has also held senior positions in the government of Mexico, among others. And Alicia has called for a debt for climate adaptation swap and the creation uh, of a Caribbean Resilience Fund. Um, after Alicia's keynote, I will uh, invite the other speakers to make brief intro remarks, and then we'll have a panel discussion among all speakers. Um, we will uh, have Shamshat Akhtar, who is chair of the board of directors uh, at Kandaras, uh, Pakistan, and uh, Shamshat uh, served, among others, as uh, the governor of the Central Bank of Pakistan, as well as finance minister of Pakistan. She's also been Under Secretary General at the UN uh, and Executive Secretary of the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific, and has really uh, a wealth of experience in issues around uh, debt and sustainability. Uh, we will then have uh, Jean-Paul Adam, who is Director for Technology, Climate Change and Natural Resources Management at the UN Economic Commission for Africa. And uh, Jean-Paul, in a previous life, uh, was Minister of Finance, Trade and Blue Economy uh, in the Seychelles, uh, where he uh, negotiated a debt for climate change adaptation swap. I'll then invite Romina Piccolotti, uh, who is the president of the Center for Human Rights and Environment and Climate Change Senior Advisor at the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development. And uh, Romina uh, is a previous uh, former environment minister uh, for Argentina. And in that role, she implemented a debt for environment swap uh, with the US. And she's recently published a note on debt for climate swaps. And Last but not least, uh, we have Stephanie Griffith Jones, who is uh, the Financial Markets Program Director at the Initiative for Policy Dialogue at Columbia University. And Stephanie is one of the world leading experts on debt crisis and international capital flows. And she has actually arranged uh, two of the very early debt for development swaps uh, for Sudan and Chile. So we have an absolutely uh, outstanding cast of speakers, and I would like to invite Alicia to deliver her keynote. And uh, Alicia, it's a great honor to have you, and I'm very much looking forward uh, to your speech. Thank you. And if I could ask colleagues to please turn off uh, uh, cameras now and then come back. Um... Okay, so let me see if I can if I can share with you my presentation. I'm going to do my best. Let's see. Just let me know if you can see it. That's very important for me. Can you see the presentation? Hello? Can you see the presentation? Sorry? 
Yes. Yes, we can see yes. it. Yes. Uh, okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Can you see it complete? Because yesterday I had a little problem. Okay. So what I'm going to do, and thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so glad to be joined by these fantastic panelists and you, and thank you for the opportunity. I am going to talk about climate action in time of COVID, debt distress, and I'm going to do the case of the Caribbean. So, um, of course, COVID is happening in a heating planet. I mean, 2016, 2020 will be the warmest five-year period on record. Global sea level rising is increasing. Sea ice extent is, is declining. One meter water equivalent glacier ice loss per year. Ice shit losing ice. So I, I'm going to refer to that in a minute in the Caribbean case. This is going to be the worst contraction in a century in Latin America and the Caribbean. And what's happening in our region is enormous fiscal costs are being disbursed. Limited resources due to the sudden collapse of sectors in the case of the Caribbean, such as tourism. Tourism has fallen strepitously and with a decline of commodity prices. So in, in spite of this, they, they have injected resources around $1.5 billion in, in the Caribbean, more than 50% are loans. But basically, the debt burden is increasing. <clears throat> we believe that there is an urgent need to reform the international financial architecture system. First of all, to consider financial stability as a public good, and therefore, the situation we are confronting today as a systemic problem, not a case by case. I'm very concerned that this is, is going to be seen as a case by case, but this is a systemic problem. And when I say this, what I want to say is that we need to expand financial support, for example, the DSSI that has been put forward by the G20 to middle income countries, small countries that are highly indebted and very vulnerable to climate change. Middle income countries represent 96% of external debt of developing countries. So DSSI is only focusing on the 4% of the global debt. So if the middle income countries have a problem of debt, the insolvency issues are going to be systemic. The establishment, we are suggesting, a establishment of an independent agency, and this is very much done by Vera Songwe, and I'm glad ECA is here, in coordination with the uh, multilateral development banks that could assist the liquidity and a sustainable facility to, to help countries on their sovereign bonds. The, 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 the other proposal is to have a UN tax committee because in the Caribbean, the problem is their voices are not heard anywhere. And they when they have to raise their issues of blacklisting, grade listing, or even uh, correspondent banking, they simply don't have a place to do this, and they are being imposed by OECD and by others. And we need to review the income per capita criteria and include vulnerability indicator. This is essential because climate change has an asymmetric effect on countries. Latin America and the Caribbean contributes only with 8.3% of the global uh, green gas emissions, but is the most high, highly vulnerable region of the world in many ways because Look at 2,309 disasters affecting 297 billion, exacerbated by climate change, costing almost $440 billion. And the estimated costs with the main physical uh, impacts will uh, probably cost to the region 1 to 5% of the region GDP. So this is going to have a very huge impact in agriculture, droughts, health, and other areas, as you can see. So we are all, I mean, this is a very asymmetric situation. COVID-19 in a heating planet, climate change vulnerability in the Caribbean. Look at how many people live in below five meters. That is in the oceans, in the coastal areas. Look at, this is the blue, the blue lines are the population that are living five meters, five meters below the coastline. And then population that live 25 kilometers of the coastline that is in, in, in orange and of course, and in and, and, and yellow, I mean, and population within five kilometers. So, and the Caribbean is being most affected. Look, this year we're gonna have 16 storms. I think we already have four. And look at Dorian. Dorian costed 
billion dollars in the Bahamas, 1% of GDP. So the, the problem of the Caribbean is that they think that they were, didn't do macroeconomic fundamentals very well, and that's why they are highly indebted. But the reality is that they are very vulnerable to climate change. So they have a debt vulnerability and very low growth because the GDP growth is, is going uh, very much down and the debt ratio is going up. The total public debt is uh, between 120 uh, GDP ratio uh, and it goes to 60% GDP ratio. So, and the Caribbean countries have structural vulnerabilities. So uh, this is what we need to, to understand. Look at the, at the levels of debt service that they have to pay. Caribbean countries have to pay between 30 uh, and 70% of the government revenue. Nothing lent, left to do other things. Antigua and Barbuda, Jamaica are paying, for example, 70% of the total government uh, revenue. Antigua and Barbuda, 42%. So you can see that uh, debt, debt service is very costly for these countries. And of course, we have the increased need for fiscal net measures and falling tax revenues is raising the risk of debt distress. Here are the, the, the amount that the countries of the Caribbean are investing, 0.5 to 2.5% to, to of GDP, except Barbados, who is uh, investing 19.2%. And we have to say that uh, the, the Caribbean countries don't have financial assistance. They don't have access to markets. The only three countries that have been able to access some loans are Jamaica, Trinidad, Tobago, Barbados, and the Bahamas. So increasing borrowing to cope with the pandemic will lead to a spike in global public debt. You can see here how much in 2020 the debt is going to go up in all the region of Latin America and the Caribbean. The number is not here, but it's 55%. A case for resilience, I think that we need to really help these countries to build resilience and to address vulnerabilities. And this has to be done. And, and the Caribbean countries cannot afford additional loans because they already have high debt. So ECLAC is supporting a debt relief for resilience, access to concessional funding, and a debt service standstill. So we want them to be included in the DSSI, as we will see right now. Uh, so. We are suggesting a regional resilience fund as a purpose vehicle for adaptation, green investment to build back better. The total debt of the Caribbean is $57 billion. We, and the debt service, as I said, range between 30 and 70. We are asking a relief of 6.9 billion, 12% of the total debt. And that is to establish a Caribbean resilience fund that could link debt with debt sustainability. And that will be to do the following to move into non-conventional renewable energies, nature-based solutions, agroecology. I mean, the Caribbean countries are importing 80% of the food, so they have to develop agroecology and aquaculture, digital inclusion, smart tourism, and sustainable resilience infrastructure. We have a portfolio of projects that could be done through this uh, resilience fund. Renewable energies, we have calculated the amount of jobs that could be generated by each one of these renewable energy. We have all the detailed information of how many jobs can be generated in the operation, construction, and maintenance. So we have five key policy recommendations. Number one, a special dispensation for the Caribbean through grant and concessional funding, debt relief, cancellation without condition analysis, access to DSSI, and making sure that the private sector comes and not only in a voluntary basis, issue reallocation of SDRs. If we get 500 billion SDR, 2 billion will go to the Caribbean. Engage private creditors for central countries like the Paris Club, establish a Caribbean resilience fund, as I said, with this initial capitalization of $7 billion, 6.9, which is only 12% of the total debt, and the participation of the global green climate fund is very important. And of course, we are uh, proposing a UN forum to an orderly sovereign debt restructuring and that we hope will, will, will soon be there. The three final things that we need for the Caribbean is to reestablish the corresponding banking, to lower the cost of remittances, to expand the role of the UN Tax Committee and give voice to the, to the small countries of the Caribbean, 
And we are suggesting a very, I would say, audacious proposal, which is credit rating regulation and a new public credit rating that could be independent because we are in the hands of only three uh, rating agencies. So, and in general, what we are suggesting in the, in the financing for development is new SDRs issuance or reallocations to mix, expanding G20 debt service suspension to broad the term to 2021, to broad the beneficiaries, to mix seats, to include multilateral debt and to ensure uh, private sector participation. And of course, as I said, this initiative should be done in response to climate swaps, debt services payments into SDG related, ensure country ownership, create these regional resilience funds, and of course, institutionalizing state contingent debt instruments like natural disaster clauses. I want to thank you so much. I hope I'm giving you an overview with a case, the case we are making in the Caribbean for, an, uh, for a debt relief for climate. Uh, I hope this is, uh, has been useful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alicia. This was really a very inspiring and very proposal. Um, apparently, uh, for some, the, the PowerPoint was, was not uh, completely visible, but uh, hopefully we can share this with, with participants later on. Um, I, I think uh, your, your case for a comprehensive systematic solution is very convincing. Uh, before we um, have uh, direct responses to, to um, your proposals and ideas, I would like to invite uh, the other panelists to, to make their interventions. And I would like to ask uh, Shamshat uh, to please go first. Shamshat, the floor is yours. Okay, um, so good morning to people out there in uh, New York. Um, I have, it's very hard to follow Alicia Barsana in anything you, you talk, uh, but perhaps rather than talk about a region, I'd like to focus on the global uh, dimension. We know that global crisis is nothing new to this world, but this time it's definitely very different. Global pandemic, uh, given its nature, has triggered the deepest recession since World War II. Loss of global jobs is significant, this reversal of poverty gains and worsening of inequalities. Navigating getting through this crisis has been complex given multiple challenges. Given the lockdown's necessity, it has been accompanied by tightened global liquidity. Economic contraction has resulted in loss of revenues, both on the external and domestic uh, side the shock to the developing and emerging markets that have been driving the global growth and exports has been phenomenal, so it is going to impact global economy. It's, of course, distracted governments from climate action as they principally struggle to run day-to-day -day affairs with the economic stimulus packages that are beyond the fiscal um, limits uh, and the rescue pa packages are confined for vulnerable groups or revival of businesses. Um, and we are in the territory of zero interest rates policy along with other forms of monetary stimulus and one doesn't know what lies ahead as we go forward. In midst of this, obviously G20 steps in and does a number of things. So the good thing is it has a standstill. But imagine what the obligations of debt servicing of large debts, which is a challenge, as Alicia has pointed out, uh, at a geographical scale. Global debt has risen to 258 trillion, which is 87 trillion over 2008, and it's 331% of the total GDP. And according to the World Bank, of the four waves of debt accumulation over the past 50 years, first three have ended with financial crisis in many emerging and developing countries. The latest wave since 2010 has already witnessed the fastest and the more broad-based increase in debt in these economies that uh, we are targeting emerging and developing. For emerging, it has risen by 54 percentage points of GDP to a historic peak of almost 170 
percent of GDP, um, and there are latest numbers still evolving. Current low interest rates, uh, of course, are uh, low. So uh, there is a hope that uh, some of the risk associated with high debt, and if there is a recovery, could be mitigated. But I don't think so. It'll be some time when we have sustainable recovery. So emerging and developing countries face weak growth prospects, mounting vulnerabilities, and elevated global risks at the same time. Exports markets have, have been um, dwindling. International cooperation has been there, but its scope and scale is limited as G20 grapples with crisis on its own doorsteps. The advanced countries are giving more liquidity domestically than international. So G20 debt stand still is limited to bilateral creditors, excluding multilateral and private creditors whose debt servicing liabilities were quite high. And even for countries with market excess, the irony is the necessity to limit non-concessional borrowing during the suspension period might limit participation, but for others it could be an essential provision of liquidity. Debt relief response, as Alicia has pointed out, and I fully support her recommendation, but I would go to the extent of saying they have to be holistic, coordinated, and equitable. They have to look at variety of criteria. This requires extension of the DSSI beyond 2020. I would go even beyond 2021, depending on what the developments in 2021 are, because we are going to have a second wave of COVID now, and we could have more complications. We have to reach out to multilateral and private creditors for considering debt relief on their uh, obligation. Sizable collective action is critical um, on building and protecting uh, safety nets, notably for low-income countries. Inadequacy of global action will hurt the pace of recovery, and attendant delays will be very costly beyond what it is today. So possible large-scale HIPAC and MRDI is critical. As you know, Jubilee Debt Campaign has estimated that cancellation of poor countries' debt payments, including to private creditor, would free $25 billion for the countries in 2020, or $50 billion if extended through 2021. So that's my recommendation, too. Overall, the proposed plan still for bilateral loans for recipient countries represent three percent 7% of their government revenues and 7% of their GDP. The World Bank uh, collective debt service payments uh, uh, forecast indicates have already mounted to 46 billion in 2020, uh, quadrupling 2021. Now, just very briefly, if private lenders come forward, the impact of standstill increases in terms of the revenue by 8.8 .8 billion. So uh, if you add up everything, it's about 1% of GDP or 5.4% of government revenues. Of course, there are all these issues about the collective action clauses, but in legalities, if you get into, there will never be an end to any um, resolution. So a potential model would be debt reduction facility used under HIPIC mm -hmm. initiative, but it requires extensive negotiation. Now, I have discussed this uh, overall, but I'm going to speak less on the latter part. I just want to say that there is need to mobilize financing, for rescue packages, accelerate and reinforce implementation of 2030 agenda for sustainable, inclusive, and green recovery, along with pursuance of low-carbon pathways, swift action to climate adaptation and mitigations in line with Paris agreements to keep all the indicators with Alicia has pointed out. Climate debt swaps have happened in the past, but very small in scale. And there is a lot of literature that has been written. They have been very small in terms of their rescue effort. But basically, what we need to do is to make sure that the um, debt swaps are, uh, are organized in an efficient manner and in an effective manner, and make sure that the cost of um, administration is manageable and that it is focused on the larger scheme of things, not on little isolated ad hoc schemes. I'm going to stop here and the rest of it can be covered because I know we have some very good uh, outside speakers and I'd like to hear them more than myself.
over to you. Thank you Thank so you much, so Shamsha. Much. Shamsha. And, uh, I, I can see that there is uh, quite a bit of uh, overlap and agreement uh, between you and Alicia, and uh, you are also calling for a systemic solution. Um, and now it's my, my privilege to uh, hand over to Jean-Paul, um, and we're keen to hear your take on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ulrich, and it's a, it's a great pleasure uh, to follow such, uh, two such uh, great speakers. And uh, I'm also in agreement with the key points that they've, they've made. I think one of the first things that uh, we need to ask ourselves when talking about debt is what is debt for? Debt should be developmental. Uh, so it should allow development gains to be accelerated uh, in a given country based on investments that can be done today and with the confidence that future economic prosperity will allow replay, repayment to take place in an affordable manner. Now, for the most part, if we look at the OECD countries, debt is an instrument which is leveraged effectively, both in times of plenty and in times of difficulty. On the one hand, it's used to multiply prosperity, and on the other, in difficult times, such as the ones we are facing now, it's used to protect populations and also to relaunch economies. The situation for Africa, however, and like much of the developing world, debt can be effective to finance, uh, to finance their, their priorities when the sun is shining. But in times of distress, this debt actually becomes a part of their vulnerability and exacerbates their inherent vulnerability. And Alicia spoke in quite detail about some of the factors of vulnerability. Uh, Africa is extremely vulnerable. And climate change was one of the biggest factors of this vulnerability, even before the onset of COVID-19. Climate change has an annual cost to African economies of between 3 to 5% annually. And that's keeping in mind that before COVID-19, the average growth in Africa was 3.2%. So almost all of the gains that are made through, uh, through uh, economic uh, progress uh, are actually mitigated largely by the impact of climate change. We should also note that African countries are actually currently running a large deficits, and this was the case even before COVID-19, where deficits were on average over 3%. Uh, the average debt to GDP ratio in Africa is also rising rapidly and is currently around 55%. And this is coupled as well with a scenario where Africa has an extremely low tax to GDP ratio of below 15%, and recent trends show that it is actually falling. Uh, the most recent figure that I have for 2018 is that the tax to GDP ratio is 13.4%. And this is coupled in the era of COVID-19 with rapid depreciation of local currencies linked to the impact on main, uh, the impact on main currency earners, for example, really in relation to commodity exports or in relation to tourism. So thus, while the debt fuel stimulus, uh, which is being deployed in OECD countries, it will probably be uh, effective and is, is addressing a lot of those needs, in, in Africa, uh, a lot of the, firstly, there's the lack of capacity to, to raise the stimulus from their existing uh, access to financial facilities, uh, but also it's diverting resources away from financing the sustainable development goals. So one of the options in particular that I'll talk about in terms of my experience is that of debt swaps. I think these are some of the innovations that can be of particular interest because they can help us adapt to climate as well as addressing some of the needs of the SDGs. So when I was working in the Seychelles government, uh, Seychelles undertook a uh, debt swap, and as far as I'm aware, it was uh, Africa's first debt swap in 2015. And the debt swap that we undertook allows uh, a portion of the country's debt to be bought back in advance at a discount. In Seychelles' ca case, the debt was bought back from the Paris Club of Creditors using a vehicle that was part financed by a soft loan from the Nature Conservancy, which is a US-based nonprofit organization, and also, uh, together with grants that have come from philanthropists uh, supportive of environmental protection. The repurchased debt is transferred from external creditors to the specially created Seychelles Con Conservation and Climate Adaptation Trust. So this debt is continuously serviced by the government, but instead of paying external creditors, it's paid to the trust. And it's paid on more advantageous terms and paid in local currency. So in Seychelles' case, the average interest rate dropped from almost 8% to below 3%. The payments to the trust are then reinvested in climate adaptation projects and in Seychelles case specifically to support the creation of marine protected areas covering one third of Seychelles exclusive economic zone 
And that means that uh, an ocean space of over 400,000 square kilometers. So the debt swap that Seychelles undertook also under, uh, opened the door for further financial innovations, including the launch of a sovereign blue bond in 2018, as the conservation and adaptation trust that existed was also used as the vehicle uh, to manage the proceeds of bonds that were floated on the international market. The bond became affordable because it received the guarantee of the World Bank, hence making it more affordable uh, in relation to the normal cost that the Seychelles government would have paid. And this is something that is uh, important for developing countries, a lot that don't have market access in the first place, and others who do have market access but pay a premium. So the project was also supported by the Global Environment Fund, uh, which allowed a portion of the proceeds to also be used as grants to finance adaptation projects as part of Seychelles Marine Special Plan, and therefore contributing to climate adaptation. So debt swaps and green and blue bonds should become part of the architecture to respond to the climate crisis and also allow us to build back better post-COVID-19 and allow us to mainstream uh, this sort of climate adaptation funding. I fully agree with previous speakers to say that it must be part of the, the, the systemic approaches that we can take. Alicia also mentioned the work that UNECA is doing to support African countries and, and also developing countries in, in general. Uh, to build uh, regional capacity to undertake uh, the preparation for debt swaps, but also uh, to address the cost of financing more generally. And we are, we are using in particular an innovation called the liquidity and sustainability uh, financing facility, which will hopefully allow countries to reduce their cost of financing by tapping into uh, the support from uh, AAA rated uh, countries and also by leveraging existing, for example, energy assets to raise additional finance. And this additional finance can come from the private sector. It's a question of making it affordable. So a lot of the, the work that's, that needs to be done around debt swaps is around making sure that debt is developmental and that it doesn't contribute further to vulnerability. And a lot of the factors that we have also discussed and which Alicia mentioned, such as having access to SDRs, will help build that resilience and allow us to address climate change as well as the response to COVID-19. Thanks so much and back to you. Thank you so much, Jean-Paul. Um, again, very inspiring. And um, uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Romina to uh, join session. And uh, we have a PowerPoint uh, that uh, should be uploaded now and hopefully this will work. Uh, Romina, over to you. It's great to have you. Um, thank you, Ulrich. It's, it's great to be in this panel. Um, I think it's so opportune to have this discussion and thank you for putting it together. It's an honor to, to share the panelists with, with such experienced uh, um, officials and, um, and scholars. So, um, the key, the, I, I agree with, with everything that has been said here, including, and I think that's a very important point from, from Alicia about this systematic approach. So the question is how to do, for me, is how to do this systematic approach at the same time that um, we move forward that show us um, how uh, the pathway. So um, I prepared this small PowerPoint to, to launch this discussion. It's called the synchronizing the sustainability of the debt with the sustainability of the earth in times of the pandemic, which I think summarizes the three challenges that we are facing as a global community, you know, fighting a pandemic and at the same time a, a, a climate um, emergency is looming in the near horizon. Um, and also there is a debt crisis um, also in the horizon that has been uh, already worn many times uh, during the past years by, by different financial institutions. So um, this challenge might present an, uh, you know, I think the unique opportunity for um, humanity to save, to save ourselves. And um, the decisions that we made today are life and death decisions for millions of people. And I think we, knew, we need to take this in mind when we approach this issue. Could you please move to the next slide? Um, 
so let me let me so this slide shows basically the, the context where uh, we're trying to implement this kind of debt relief packages and as i say it will represent the difference between uh life and death situation so 40 to 60 million people will be pushed into extreme poverty this is something that the world bank has said in august and it's a consequence of the impacts already of of the pandemic uh they they've reached a record of 256 3 trillion last year that's equivalent to 322 percent of global gdp and i have been said before by the speakers you know um almost all of the revenues uh the large percentage of the revenues of developing countries are just going to to serve the debt um so there's no room at all for for development uh or for increasing climate climate ambition or, or climate resilience um, more than 40% of um, developing countries are at high risk, high risk of debt distress. In 2019, before the pandemic, more than 60 countries spent more on debt servicing than on public health. So obviously nobody was prepared for, uh, for when, when a global pandemic struck. Um, the total amount of sovereign debt repayment due at the end of 2021 is 2.7 trillion with 1.62 trillion due in 2020 already and 1.8 trillion in 2021 it is clear that um, most of the developing countries will not be able to repay the debt as was negotiated um, so debt restructuring um, is happening as we speak and will happen massively in 2019, um, also climate change contributed to extreme weather events causing at least 100 billion in damages. And um, as John Paul was referring to, uh, obviously this uh, impacts tremendously Africa and, and also, also the Caribbean, as Alisa was, was referring, the most vulnerable suffered the most. Um, by 2050, uh, cumulative damages from climate change may reach 8 trillion impoverishing by 3% gross world product. Um, some economists already are saying that the hit will be 10% on global GDP uh, by, just by climate. And as the IPCC has, has told us on the 1.5C report, um, we have 10 years to remain um, uh, under 1.5 and and to revert the the course of irreversible climate change where uh, mitigate, mitigating shortly climate potentials is essential uh, to revert the crisis and tackle the emergency can, can we move to the next state uh, the next slide please so connecting the dots and many of you have already seen these pictures many times that's the little dot over there is the earth. Um, so when I say connecting the dots, is to save that dot, uh, basically, that is planet Earth. Um, and what we, we do have today that we didn't have, when I least I, I was implementing the debt swap um, the, for environment in Argentina, we did a, a, a bilateral agreement with the US and that allow us, as in the case of John Paul, to undertake several projects um, in exchange for, for the swap to protect the environment. We do have a Paris Agreement. We do have the Montreal Protocol, uh, Kigali Amendment. We do have um, the UN Biodiversity Convention, and we have um, IPCC Special Report on Global Warming of 1.5. I mean, this is a strong uh, governance, um, governance um, uh, pillars that I think can help can help us on this systematic approach. Um, some of these treaties include a strong scientific um, panels that can guide governments on what can deliver the most on jobs, on resilience, on uh, to tackle the climate emergency, um, and at the same time 
provide some vehicles, including NDCs, national uh, action plans, etc., that governments you know can use when they negotiate also the, the portfolio and include this as part of the of the governance structure. Um, can when we move forward to the next slide? So um, I I I. I I developed these principles after uh, having a lot of discussions with many stakeholders, including governments and um, officials at, at different financial institutions. Um, it's just, you know, this is just very, very preliminary, but I wanted to share this with you. Um, and um, the first principle is, you know, debt for climate swaps are not new conditionalities to debt relief but a new form of sovereign debt payment. This basically recognizes the efforts that developing countries uh, are putting and can put to preserve a common good, which is the atmosphere. Um, and I think um, this, is, uh, this is essential. It's not, um, it, this is this is not just new this is not should be seen as, as new conditionalities but rather as an investment on the capacity of debtor countries to to repay debt you know nobody will be able will be able to repay debt with an unstable climate system that's impossible so if you're the creditor and you want some of your debt back um you need to invest on the capacity of the of the countries to pay back and that investment on on climate mitigation and adaptation. Um, avoid being too little too late. This is a little bit, Alisa touched on this. Um, this is not little things here and there. It's not trivial negotiation of debt. Debt for climate swaps should, should be mainstream on the sustainable uh, negotiation of restructuring of debt. Um, Principle three is incorporate climate risk in this assessment. This was also touched by some of the panelists. Um, the countries that that accepted uh, the offer of debt relief during the pandemic will were hit um, tremendously by the debt rating agencies. I, I mean, this is this is. Um, uh, and and we, we need to we need to begin to um, but Alisa talk about you know having a new debt agency um, because we are being hostages by three or four or four of them. Uh, but what I think is really really important here is that climate risk um, is incorporated in economic models. So the more that you swap debt for climate, the better your debt rating should be. The more that you invest on climate resilience, um, the more your debt should be, and not the other way around, because it's not where you know where um, we're just putting so much pressure on on developing countries that um, they will end just um, uh, over exploiting their natural resources to pay the debt, and then accelerating the climate crisis. And we need to we need to um, cut this perverse cycle, to break this perverse cycle. And so that's it. The, 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 connect, the connection with debt rating is really, really important. And the IMF and the Environmental Development Bank, uh, the uh, European, sorry, uh, Development Bank should be uh, at the top front, I think, on promoting uh, the incorporation of climate risk modeling in, in their economic assessments. Um, Link debt for climate swap with national climate commitments. Uh, this is something that Seychelles has done with John Paul. I think that's extremely important. Um, you know, the, basically the revenues that you generate with uh, your debt swaps are reinvested in climate, in climate ambition. Uh, set a transparent governance system to make decisions and track the money. I will go faster so, so we can move out in the discussion. Uh, can you move to the so incorporate metrics uh, to evaluate climate and economic impacts, including jobs creation, etc. Uh, reinvest the venue, revenues to increase climate ambition. Use climate debt swaps to leverage climate finance. Uh, we did that in Argentina, and John Paul did the same. 
for the seashells, we can use, you know, the green climate fan, the green environmental facility uh, to uh, increase um, and the uh, and, and make it stre stronger the, the, the climate. That's what um, this is very important. The role of the state is to protect people, not to bail out inefficient companies. So this moment and through the debt swap, countries should be investing in, in the transformation of the industries uh, rather than uh, trying to use um, and the little uh, economic stimulus package they can put together or the big economic stimulus package they can put together to bail out inefficient companies. Um, and the principle 10, which is um, linked debt for climate fat with pipeline infrastructure projects that reduce climate risk, create more jobs and saves consumer money. Investment on uh, renewable, investment on energy efficiency. Um, we do know um, they produce jobs at home. They create um, um, savings for the consumers and at the same time, they help, help with resilience. So um, that's it, and I will, I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Romina, for, again, a uh, very rich uh, discussion. Um, we are running out of time, so I fear we won't uh, get to the general discussion in the end that we uh, really would love to have, but uh, I would like to invite Uh, um, join the discussion and uh, make your uh, input. Stephanie, are you there? These are the problems with online conferencing. Stephanie, are you with us? Who? Um, okay. Um, let's hope that Stephanie will will uh, join um, in a moment. But if I could please invite uh, all speakers to go back, uh, turn their video on, and uh, then we'll uh, start the discussion now. I hope Stephanie uh, can manage to get back in, um, but. Ah, Shamshat uh, is there, Romina. Um, it's a pity that we've lost Stephanie because uh, uh, she would have, uh, without doubt, made some very uh, insightful uh, comments. So um, we have, uh, well, a little bit more than five minutes left, um, <laughs> which doesn't lend itself to a very uh, elaborate discussion, especially not uh, since we had so many very rich points. Um, uh, I would say that um, uh, so there there are no no questions in the chat right now, uh, but uh, I, I would say um, let's briefly talk uh, what are in in terms of uh, moving ahead. We've we've heard a lot of great ideas now. Um, how do you think? Uh, could could we really move this agenda ahead? If if everyone could just spend one minute on say, saying uh, how to advance this agenda, I mean there, there's a relatively broad agreement on on the general direction of travel, I would say. Um, but um, and 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 we go in the order of um, appearance. So if I could could call on Alicia to go first, and please everyone. Uh, uh, keep with one minute because we have to uh, close on time because there will be another very good panel directly after us and we, we must not eat into their time. Uh, Alicia, please, and, and also kind of one minute comment and closing statement in, in, at the same time. And you're unmuted. Uh, muted. Turn my mic on. Okay, thank you very much. I really, I truly enjoy the, the panel and thank you so much. What I would like to say is that um, I think we, we want to go for five things. And I guess this is where I, I believe we have to make, uh, to make us a tangible results. I've seen the Financing for Development Initiative of the Prime Minister of Jamaica, Canada, and the Secretary General is an opportunity. We need to make sure 
that on 29 September, we have the heads of state there. We had a very powerful meeting yesterday with all the Caribbean prime ministers, and we discussed these issues, and we agreed that we are going to go for these five proposals uh, up and running because we believe that these are essential. So we are going to go for the special dispensation for the Caribbean, grant and concessional funding, debt relief without conditionalities, access to enhance the SSI, bringing in the private sector, extending the term, and of course, including middle-income countries, SIDS. Secondly, issuance and reallocation of SDRs. We believe this is possible, it has to be done for the establishment of the Caribbean Resilience Fund with this $7 million, which is 12% of the total debt of the Caribbean. And, and five, we need the Green Climate Fund, GCF, to come in. And I think we are in, in, in very good shape to at least get these five proposals. And, Jean Paul, we are seriously, yesterday the Prime Minister of Barbados mentioned the elements that you said about the special vehicle of sustainability and liquidity, because that is for countries that have access to markets. And, and that's to alleviate them liquidity to, to, to these. Some countries do have access to markets, but some don't. So we have to make sure that we prepare those. But I think we do have capacity to do and to get tangible results on 29 September. We have to push for that. And we have all the prime ministers of the Caribbean on board. And we hope the rest of the Latin Americans will also show there. I think this is what we can do. We have to convince them to be there. This is a political process. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Alicia. I, I just saw that Stephanie is back, back in the room. Uh, I hope she can join us at least for the last three minutes. Uh, and, and I'm very sorry, we have to log off at, at, uh, on time because uh, there will be the following session. Stephanie, are you with us? Uh, and in the meantime, may I ask Shamshat to please um, clip in? And you're on mute. Ah, so, can you hear me? Sorry, I'm really now, sorry. Stephanie's I don't back. know what let's, happened. Let's move to Stephanie. So I'll be very quick. First, I want to say I'm delighted to be here with such excellent speakers and distinguished. I want to start by backing uh, what Alicia said at the beginning about the need for a reform of international financial architecture. Uh, so things like SDR issues. And also, I would like to highlight increase the capital of multilateral development banks, because we have to think not just about debt relief, but also about new money. Um, Debt relief, as Romina said, um, in general and in relation to nature, debt for nature swaps, uh, in the past has always been too little, but also too late. Whether it was the Latin American debt crisis, the HIPIC initiative, and the EU cri debt crisis, the, the, the help has always come too late with massive costs to the debtors, and in the end to the creditors. So what we need, and I want to focus on the debt swaps, what we need is significant scale of debt relief, as well as additional finance, both public and private, for climate change mitigation and adaptation. And I think that establishing the link between debt relief to climate finance may both generate significant additional debt relief and additional climate finance. And why is that? We have a problem because this crisis is actually symmetrical. And whether we like it or not, unfortunately, developed countries are not feeling so generous because they are suffering from the crisis themselves. They, of course, don't worry so much that the crises are worse and have worse effects in regions like Latin America and Africa. Uh, so I think if we create this link uh, where climate mitigation is very clearly a global public good and it's totally urgent because we know that the planet cannot wait and we only have one. And there is very strong political support by governments, but also by people, especially young ones, for uh, effort to mitigate and adapt to climate change. Uh, we may get a better chance uh, of achieving significant debt relief. And also from an economic point of view, of course, if, for example, you have proper climate adaptation, this increases uh, the benefits of 
uh, reducing the cost um, to um, uh, of raising money on the sovereign bond market. And Uli Wolfs, our, our distinguished chairman, has been part of a report by UNEP which shows that if you reduce climate vulnerability, your sovereign rating will actually improve and the cost of finance you can raise will also improve. So there's a clear link between money spent on climate mitigation and even climate adaptation uh, with improving uh, the credit worthiness of countries. So the experience, has, as has been said, has been of fairly small deals, not trivial. Uh, the total of debt development swaps was about $6 billion in the past. But we want something much bigger uh, and less transaction costs, more agile. So the large scale is essential. So we have to move at a national level from specific projects to budget support, to special trust funds. And internationally, we have to move from specific credited to debt deals to uh, multilateral initiatives. I think the initial step was established by the Paris Club which has already accepted to allocate resources that go for development for additional debt relief. It has to be streamlined and accelerated, and it has to be broadened much further, both within the Paris Club to other official creditors. And we haven't mentioned China, but of course now China is a major creditor, but also, of course, very difficult, the private sector and the multilaterals. And I, I would just uh, like to add that we need a comprehensive package which includes debt reduction and new flows. And I think what is very interesting in the case of Seychelles and of Argentina that we've heard is that the debt relief linked to climate swaps has catalyzed new funding, both public and private. And the modalities and the balance between both uh, may vary by country. I think that is very important to have a sense of flexibility. Um, but the, the way Colombia would do debt relief would be different from the way Mali would do it, for example, Haiti. So we have to be flexible, but we need a multilateral initiative. And in, in the finance minister's meeting at the UN that Alicia mentioned, uh, there was broad support, particularly from the African countries and from ECLA, for these debt for nature swaps. Uh, which I think can be a valuable mechanism to achieve the far greater goal of uh, liberating resources uh, for development. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm really sorry about the problem before. Thank you so Thank much, you. Stephanie. And I'm so glad that you managed to get on because this was really very important uh, intervention. So now we're facing the problem that we are already three minutes over time and uh, the organizers told me that I must, must, must finish on time because three minutes ago, another session started uh, on financing the Paris Agreement post-COVID with Barbara Buchner, Joan Carling, Patricia Espinosa, and Bill McKibben. So we are in uh, good competition. Um, I would love to continue this discussion with you. And I, I very much uh, invite you to uh, have this discussion uh, with, with us going forward because we need it. Uh, but unfortunately, I have to cut it off now. And I'm so sorry about this. And sorry for, for starting a little bit late and, and uh, poor time management from my side. But thanks very, very much, uh, Alicia, for a wonderful keynote, uh, incredible swords, uh, Jean-Paul, Stephanie, Shamshat, and Romina. Um, very rich discussion. Uh, we'll close now and uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you and bye-bye. And do join the next discussion with Barbara, Patricia, and Bill. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.